When we're exploring figurative meaning, we are always focusing on some sort of dichotomy. And what is that dichotomy again, Paige? What's the dichotomy that figures as the foundation of figurative meaning? Oh, I sprung it on you before you had your notes ready. Tegan, help her out. That's true, but what's the dichotomy in figurative meaning analysis? Very good. So yesterday we're talking about literal and figurative oppositions. The actual versus the representational, the concrete versus the abstract. So every time you are discussing some sort of figurative meaning, you're talking about these two different worlds. And you're talking about how language brings us over from one to the other. And of course, those examples of language are several that you already talked about. Um, the metaphors, personification, symbolism, symbolism especially. I had some examples up there. Anybody look those up? Yeah, no. OK. <laughs> Well, I'll see if anybody goes that extra step to look something up. But we are focusing on imagery and symbolism throughout the Obasan unit. We'll focus on these two, which is why you're keeping the imagery and symbol journal. And I want to give you methods for analyzing both. Let's start with imagery. Um, let's see. Sheridan, can you give me a def definition of imagery, please? That's cr correct, but the author doesn't use the five senses. What does the author use? There you go. I like that Sheridan talks about the five senses because in imagery, students often think, well, it creates a picture. No, it creates a picture and a sound and a smell and a taste and so on. So any words that convey the five senses. Okay, good enough, easy enough definition. However, if it were that easy, we'd still be freshman level. I want to advance this a little bit. The meaning of words exists on two levels. Anybody remember what those two levels are? Alex? Thank you. This should be review from a number of years ago. Denotation and connotation. Denotation being the literal dictionary definition of the term. Oh, sounds like that left-hand side of the dichotomy. And connotation being the associated images, maybe the abstract notions, personal reactions. Connotation is often very personal. Individuals have different connotative reactions to different words, but we're generally the same. Generally, words work the same for me as they do for you. Some significant differences exist, though. Um, for instance, uh, here in the West, what color do we associate with mourning and death? Black. Um, in East Asian cultures, what color do they associate with mourning and death? Tyler? Uh, nope. White. White. So if you're attending a funeral in the United States, it would be customary to wear black. If you're attending a funeral in Japan, you might be wearing white. But for the most part, connotations are, are pretty universal. Let's look at page two. The hill surface, as if responding to a command from uncle's outstretched hand, undulates suddenly in a breeze. With ripple after ripple of grass, shadows rhythmical as ocean waves, we wade through the dry surf, the flecks of grass hitting us like spray. Okay, some imagery. There's more imagery on the page that we will address, but let's focus on this initially. What word draws our attention? What word do you want for uh, some close analysis? Lance, what do you think? You like ripple? Okay. Especially since she repeats it. Ripple after ripple. Talk to me about ripple a little bit. Hold on. See? You're going too far ahead, too fast. Give me denotation first. What's the dictionary meaning of the word? What is a ripple? It's 
small wave, right? Small wave. Now connotation. We start with basics on connotation. Let's go very basic. Positive or negative? Positive. Good. Now expand, Lance. Positive how? What sort of emotions or feelings would you receive with ripple? Calm. Lance, thank you for playing so well today. I'm going to give you a sweatshirt as a present. Here, anytime. Um, somebody want to advance this? Calm, peaceful. What else? That's it? Calm, peaceful. Does that, that work? Does that cover it? Good enough. Um, Miriam, pick another word that you think really deserves our attention. Something in there that's an interesting word that you want to focus on. Rhythmical? Good. Let's do the same thing that Lance did. Give me a denotation of rhythmical. What does it mean, literally? In sync. Okay. Anybody want to add anything to the denotation of rhythmical? It's a pattern, right? It's beat oriented. So it's a beat oriented pattern. So when Miriam's talking about in sync, she's probably talking about repeated pattern. Miriam, if something seems rhythmical to you, let's work with our connotation. Start where Lance started. Positive or negative? Positive. Good. And um, what does rhythmical give you as far as emotional connection or association? Is it comforting? Yes. Why? Uh -huh. Not quite sure why, but you're absolutely right. It is comforting. Um, you're in. Is organization comforting? Absolutely it is. <laughs> Coming from the OCDs in the room. Yeah, organization is the only thing that's comforting. Brianne. Good. So it's predictable. And predictability is comforting too, right? So. Um, Patterns are predictable. Patterns are organized. The denotation of the word rhythmical, this in sync idea that Miriam came up with, is predictable, organized, and therefore reassuring and comforting. Somebody pick another word that you want to focus on. Undulates. Thank you, Paulina. We'll do the same thing, but I've run out of space, so let's do it verbally. Um, definition? I love when students define by using their hands. Um, this is exactly how I would. This is how I would define undulates, Paulina. Right? Isn't his hand, his outstretched hand, is undulating? Right? Isn't that what it's doing? Why are you all laughing at me? Clarkson has uncanny control over his body. Look at that. Come on, folks. Logan, you can't do that? I can't do it. You can't? I can't do it. Can you do the Vulcan salute? Can you do other sorts of weird things? Yeah. Hey, you can do that one. All right. I can't do that. Okay, for those people for those people watching for those people watching the exciting non-moving screen online and wondering why we're all laughing, um, Paulina, can you give me a, a, a word based definition of undulate? It's not live. But thank you for asking, Allie. To move in a wave-like fashion, right? Isn't that what undulate means? To move up and down in a wave-like fashion? OK. I'm sorry, I'll stop that. It's distracting. Positive or negative, Paulina? Positive. Probably some of the same sort of ideas. Comforting, calm, and peaceful. So we're seeing a trend. There's a trend of connotation which is creating a reaction of calm and peace and comfort. Let's extend for a moment. Can you think of why we as human beings would feel calm, comforted, secure, and peaceful when presented with calm water and rhythm imagery? 
where do I, because it's calming, okay, that, thank you for the circular answer. Um, where do I first encounter rhythm? What? Thank you. <laughs> That's weird. Because some of our, okay, um, you're sophomores. Next year, many of you will be taking psych, psychology, and many of you will learn that um, the formative experience in the womb is an extraordinarily powerful experience in the human psyche. That it's an experience of comfort and, and complete and utter safety. And the first moment of distress in our life is probably birth. The expulsion from the womb. It's like, wait a minute. It was warm and comfortable in there, and there was like this cool music. Thump, thump, thump. Um, so, so what's going on? Get, um, she under. <laughs> some some psychologists believe that uh, many actions are efforts to resecure that comfort and peace, and it, it makes sense. But she's securing water and rhythm and calm wave imagery, of course it's creating this sort of calm with most people. But we are on the figurative level, understanding the reaction with us. What's she using it for? What's it all for? Why is she creating this calm? Where is it directed? On this page, where is she directing this feeling? She's, well, she wants the reader to feel it toward what? No. What? The coolie is only incidental. It's primarily uncle. Uncle is at the center of this. How does she want us to feel about the uncle? He's comforting, secure. He's a calm, peaceful presence. Is he perfect? Read the next line. Emily, could you read that next uh, sentence loudly and clearly for me, please? Dizzy, I asked, grabbing him as he wobbles unsteadily on one leg. Okay. I'm sorry? <laughs> Did we skip one? Uh, oh, we skipped one uh, sentence. That's okay, Emily. Back up one more sentence. Um, um, oh. Uncle walks jerkily as a baby on the unsure ground, his feet wide spread, his arms suddenly out like a tightrope walker when he loses his balance. Excellent. Thank you, Emily. Emily, can you pick one word out of those sentences that seems to contrast with these words like ripple and undulates? There you go. The word just sounds wrong. <laughs> undulates sounds beautiful. It's got this sonorous kind of uh, um, kind of sense to it. Jerkily. It, she's a good writer. She's a good writer because she's describing something. You're probably reading it and thinking, well, that's, you know, it's nice writing. It flows pretty well. Yeah, it's also working on a number of different levels. Are they affecting you? You bet they are. Have you noticed it? Probably not. The point of this class is for you to notice it. The point of this class is for you to understand that not only do we have this calm imagery here, you also have breaks because she wants to say, uncle is comforting, but he's flawed in some way. This is a broken man. And you'd say, well, yeah, he's broken. He's old. There's more than that. And she's foreshadowing some of the tragedy within his life. Can you show me in this selection where those breaks are? What words also provide some strain of breakage to the calm? Suddenly. Excellent. What else? Catherine. Grass hitting us. Very good. Shadows. We've got shadows. Possibly command. She's playing two sides. She's giving you overwhelmingly calm and peaceful imagery connected to Uncle, but at the same time she wants to characterize Uncle in a complex fashion. You get some darkness in there too. I don't expect you to conduct this close analysis with every page of the book. If you did that, you would drive yourself insane. And if you think that's how I read the book, you're wrong. Think about what we talked about yesterday and think about what we're talking about today. I said every once in a while the fl red flag will go up. 
man, she spent a lot of time on this image. Or wait a minute, this is the second time I heard about this. Or wait a minute, why is there stone bread? That's weird. And that's when you turn on the analysis and you devote your attention to it. And then you generate all sorts of conclusions that uh, help you unlock the meaning that she's presenting to you. And she's a good writer, so she keeps it under the surface in the level of figurative meaning. If she came right out and said, um, Uncle was a calm and peaceful man. I liked him, and he made me comfortable. He made everybody comfortable and feel secure. But there was something wrong with him. He was flawed or broken in some way. I'm glad Catherine's laughing. That's bad writing. Okay, and if you read that book, you should close it right then and put it aside and never read it again. That's poor writing. This is good writing. Next, symbolism. Uh, definition? Jason, give me a definition of symbolism. Very good. Can somebody help me specify the two things? The first thing must be of a certain quality. The second thing must be of a certain quality. You're in. Uh, but they're very related in some way. Otherwise, it's not going to work. If I say, hey, th this monkey represents industrialization. I'm like, what? How did you get that? No, it doesn't. So they've got to be linked in some way. Miriam? Yes, so she says object and idea. I'll go back to our original dichotomy and say concrete represents abstract. There you go. The definition must be clear. This object represents this person. No, it doesn't. Symbols don't represent people. They represent ideas, period. Now, that idea may be related to this person in another way, but there's a, there's a wrinkle of logic in there that you must unpack. And you start with this definition. One other aspect of the definition. In symbolism, is the relationship one to one, one to one, or is the relationship one to many? Are there many ideas that a symbol represents, or simply one? One to one. One to one? 50 50 shot. Answer is no. Which, <laughs> sorry, Blake, you tried. Um, Blake, what other figurative language seems to be a one for one relationship? This is like this, this is this. That's simpler. Other figurative language, not symbolism. Yeah. Similes and metaphors are one to one. So if I say the sun is like an oven, that's a one for one, right? Sun and oven, very simple relationship, very local. <laughs> Sorry, um, metaphor and simile, right? This is their symbolism. And it looks like mex sim, OK. Um, so there's your, your specific definition. The use of a single concrete object to represent a collection of abstract ideas. Can a color be a symbol? Yes. Why? It's a concrete object. Concrete because it's visual. Green and red could represent Christmas. Um, and we talked about black and white having different representations of uh, mourning, um, different symbolic um, importance there. And next year, you'll probably read Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, which includes probably six or seven colors that have different symbolic significance. Um, concrete does not mean that I can touch it. It means that I can sense it. I've read student writing on symbolism. And early in my career, when I didn't really know how to do it myself, the student writing was all over the place. And sometimes they did good work with symbol analysis. Sometimes they were missing pieces. Their claims were out of whack. Their support was broken. And I tried to help them improve. And I developed eventually four questions. 
that can help develop supporting detail for symbolism. And I found after a while that the four questions worked. But we need, uh, we need something to apply it to. Uh, can you give me a symbol? A what? Oh, the flag. OK. Let's work with the flag then. What does the flag symbolize? Are we talking about the US flag, the old stars and stripes? OK, Blake, so give me one idea that the flag symbolizes. Freedom. Freedom. How does it symbolize that? Great, so we created it um, at the point at which we won independence and freedom from the British, and it's evolved since that first creation, but basically same thing. Can you tell me what else the US flag represents? Um, well, all the stars on the flag represent different states. So it's sort of a balance between unity and individualism, right? Because they're different stars, but they're all in the same field. Good, so we have unity, individualism, freedom. What else, Tegan? Uh, oh. Oh, so it's an, it, it represents history, right? Yeah. Understanding our history, knowing who we are, that means identity. So wow, we've got identity and freedom and unity and independence. Brianne, did you have a, okay. Pride, sure. Um, so the way in which people react to it help understand that it's some sort of nationalistic pride. The first question you must ask is what is what are the object's definitional qualities so let's say i'm writing a story and in it somebody walks up to the american flag what do they do to it or what do they do with it help me tell the story um, they hug it all right okay they hug the flag um what's the uh, context blake what's going on in the story when they hug the flag What? They're happy about it. They're just new. <laughs> look very new. Um, okay, they're happy about it because it was just made here. Um, there's your flag. Okay. Doesn't look just made to me, but you're hu you're hugging it. Okay, why are you hugging it? Because it was thrown to you. So you're you're hugging it, and you have a very very beatific smile on your face as you're hugging <laughs> hugging it. Excellent. This is our story. What are the object's definitional qualities? Now, when I say definitional qualities, I don't mean what are the qualities of that object. I mean what are the qualities of all flags? What are all flags? Okay, all flags are used to represent a nation. What else can we say about all flags? Think very basic definitional. Tim? Okay. All national flags do. Certain other flags are uniform. Paulina? Fabric. Which means they are all artificial. Now you can say, no, it's cotton, it's natural. No, 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 no. It's, it doesn't grow on trees. Flags don't, you know, come out of flag plants. Um, they come out of flag factories. Uh, you're in. Rectangular. Okay. Hey, 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 hold on. So if this is not a definitional quality and you're saying not all of them are, then we take it off the list. What? Of these facts, do you think is pretty interesting about this object? I think it's pretty interesting that it's artificial. She is clinging to something that is human made. She is not throwing her attention behind the earth or some sort of aspect of the natural environment. She's throwing her attention behind human beings and human society. Blake is being made happy by something about human endeavor and human ingenuity, not about the natural world. The fact that these represent nations is probably pretty important too. So we've asked our first question, definitional qualities. Next, describing the object. Blake, could you give us some description of that flag that you have in front of you? 
Sure. But um, all American flags are red, white, and blue. Talk about that particular flag. It's big. It's big. It seem to be pretty substantial or pretty thin. Now <laughs> one, one, substantial or thin. Oh, thin. <laughs> there you go. Thin. Um, it's, it's kind of thin. And is it uh, dingy or is it clean? Look at it. Don't look at me. Dingy. It's kind of dingy and thin. Shh. I've just written the symbol as dingy and thin. And Blake's holding on to it for dear life. Hold on. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Don't stop. Meaning may have changed in the way that I describe it. I must be attentive to how the author describes the symbol. Not just what it is, but how the author describes it. How does the object behave? What does it do? Well, in this case, it's pretty inanimate. And it's just being held, so even if it could have some action, Blake's restricting that action. But this one's probably more important with our example. How do characters interact with it? Blake is hugging it. It makes her happy. That's important. We have a symbol that represents a number of ideas um, definitionally. It's associated with certain aspects of nationhood. This particular object is dingy and thin, rather insubstantial. And Blake's holding on to it because it makes her very happy. This is interesting data, data that we have that we can now proceed to a conclusion. What conclusion? What does it represent? I don't know. I'm not going that far. We haven't gotten that far yet. Let's take a look at the spider. Page is the spider on? Or spiders, I should say. 28? 28 or 29, I think. Miriam? What was that? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were asking a question. What page? 29. As she pushes a box aside, she stretches the corner of a spider's web, exquisitely symmetrical, balanced between the box and the magazines. A round black blot, large as a cat's eye, suddenly sprouts legs and ambles across the web, shaking it. It pauses, and another spider of a different variety comes scuttling up. It is lighter in color, its legs more muscular, striped, and tapered. Its antennae are short knobs that protrude like eyes from its head. Sidling aggressively, it reaches its long pincer legs out toward the first. The tips touch. In a burst of speed, the first spider leaps down the roadway of webs and disappears into the floorboards. We already decided yesterday that this was worthy of our attention. Now let's apply some of our um, symbol analysis techniques to it. What are the definitional qualities of a spider? You're in? The definitional qualities of any spider, not this. Remember, you're on question two. Okay, so they have eight legs. Keep going, folks. Just yell it out. What's that, Reba? Oh, eight eyes, or eight legs, and multiple eyes. They're small. Good. What else? Uh, they're ugly. Some people will say, "No, I love spiders. They're pretty." Yeah, most people don't. They're normally black. They're they're dark colored in some way, brown, black, gray. Whole what? Right? Aren't spiders? Don't spiders work for a living? They're not like lazy insects. No, no, no. After they built, man, they build this elaborate trap and web, and then they sit and wait. They're not, they're not lazy. They're paying attention. You know what's a lazy? What's a lazy insect? Slug's a lazy insect. Roly poles a lazy insect. Praying mantis? No, man. Those things work. They stalk. They hunt, and they eat their mates. Come on, they're working all the time. Shh. 
These are some qualities of spiders. They're small, they're rather loathsome, and they work a lot. She's chosen a spider. She, the author, decides, I'm going to pick a spider to represent what I want. What else could she have picked in an attic? Mouse? Rat? What else? Raccoon? There could be a raccoon in there. Anything. A box. No, hey. Alex is absolutely correct. She could have picked something inanimate. She's picked something natural. The question is why? Why would she pick something natural? Why would she pick something loathsome? Why would she pick something industrious? I don't know. How's the author describe it? Pick out words or phrases that you think are important to understanding how it's described. Allie. A round black blot. Round black blot. Did you notice the alliteration, by the way? Black blot suddenly sprouts, ambles across. What else? Alex. Right. Uh, so where's... Okay, so she's saying it's large. That's right. So the, it's a small spider, but it seems large. Okay, that's interesting. What else is interesting about the description? Nothing else? Reba. Muscular. Have you ever thought of a spider's legs as muscular? That's weird. Striped, tapered. Okay. Yeah, we could. We're gonna have to pick it up just a little bit. How's the object behave? You, Alex. Yeah, there, there's a conflict, right? So it seems to be a conflict. These fight. These spiders are fighting. That's important. Can you uh, pick up some phrases in here that help? Yeah, Lance. Yeah, sidling aggressively. Where did I, why did I lose that? Okay, sidling aggressively. Pick out one other. The burst of speed. Very good. There are more answers, by the way, but this is just a sampling. Characters or other objects interact with the object. What is Obasan doing? Is Obasan watching it? She uncovers it, right? She's the one who pushes the box aside? What's Naomi doing? This is just data gathering. So far, we're in day three of Obasan. We're still just data gathering, because there's a process for data gathering that's relatively involved. The more you practice it, the faster you become with it, it becomes easier. We're almost to that point where I'll help you see how that data generates conclusions. And then we'll fully explore the method. And that'll probably be with reading number three. So remember what we're doing in this class. For Obasan, for the reading portion of the unit, I'm teaching you method of analysis, method of imagery and symbol analysis primarily. And we're taking our time with it. So keep track of all the different steps. We haven't generated conclusions as yet, but we will. Quick questions? That was alliteration, by the way. I can sense the pride in my audience.